Okay, shalom everyone, and welcome to another Thursday night Isaiah study. We're looking at the last part of Isaiah 22, and it is verses 17 to 25. And I titled the study tonight, Isaiah Speaks of One Being Given Keys, Having the Power to Open and Shut, and No Man Has Authority to Change What Is Done. That's a powerful, powerful thing. And uh, so in, in this week's Isaiah study, Isaiah, he, he continues speaking how Shebna will be taken and carried away to die in a foreign land. And these verses are believed to be directed to Shebna as a prediction of what is to come. Okay. So Isaiah he says the following concerning verses uh, 17 and 18 here. So in, in verse 17, yeah, this verse here, let me change my color first. A little slow. Okay. Okay. So, okay, it says in verse 17, it says, Hine. Adonai mat, uh, mat, mataltelha, uh, tatela, gavar veotcha ato. And it means, Behold, the Lord will carry you away with a mighty captivity and will surely cover you. And then in verse 18 it says, Tsanof yitznatcha senepa kadur. El Eretz Rahavat Yadayim Shama Tamut Veshama Mark 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 Kevot Vekavodeha Kelon Vayit Adonaiha. Okay, so, and it says, He will surely violently turn and toss you like a ball in a large county or country or large land. And, um, there shall you die, and, and there the chariots of your glory will be the shame of your Lord. Okay, and um, so in these two verses, there there is there is a a direct declaration of the divine punishment according to Isaiah 22 verses 17 to 18. And here Isaiah says, he says, Hine Adonai mital techa, mital telcha. Okay. Okay, and, and that means, behold, Hashem will violently eject you. Okay, and then he's speaking to this person, to Shebna, that, that God's going to eject you. And, and the idea I got was, it reminded me of like the old uh, CD technology, and where that uh, this, there's this verbiage of rejection where you, you put in a corrupted media and it just, just keeps popping out, right? You remember those days? And you have, I used to have a CD drive in my car, and I would pop in a CD that was scratched, and the stinking thing would keep popping back out. Ah, right? Well, anyway, so uh, this word, this word, mital telcha, is the, um, the, literally, the violently ejecting you out of your position, okay? And so this idea we get is this, this rejection of by God. And we note that there's a repetition here, um, tautela, that of the same word. Where you can see the, the the same root here, root word, and it's meant for emphasis. Isaiah says that the strong man will be violently ejected, right? The the gevar, right? The the, the strong man, the young, strong, uh, strapping man that is able for war, he will be rejected. And and then it it goes on and says that the Lord will seize and take hold of you and, and seize and take hold okay and and this is what what we see here in um, the end of verse 17 and so the implication is that the Lord God Almighty will seize and carry away the one who is filled with pride right you know these things illustrate the dangers of pride and why we should always be on our guard against such things and so I thought to look at a comparison 
with on verse 17. So we look at the, the Septuagint and the, the Hebrew Bible, the Targum Jonathan, and then the, the Peshitta. And so when we look, we're looking at this text, you can literally see, you can literally see like a a one for one uh corresponding corresponding translation uh, and when we look at the Hebrew and the, the, the Targum, for example, okay, and, and even with the Linden Peshitta, right, and uh, we, we can see that uh, there is a, uh, there is, there's literally a, almost like a one-to-one -one translation, and the reason why this is important is because, as it says here in, in the, the Aramaic translation, it says that um, he will, God will cast away, and that He will lead you, lead you astray. Okay, and so what we get out of these, these, uh, these words here in in the Syriac, and and the interesting thing about when when we study the languages is that these these things just kind of leap out at us, you know, because we're trying to understand what's being written here, what what is the translation into English, right? And so these things, these these uh, these. These just, just the it's very neat because I what I like about the translations is that um, what we see here in the in the Peshitta is how the Lord God is the one that's doing the shaking right and the one who is filled with pride will be led astray by God Himself. Isn't that significant? And it, you see how serious this situation may be that one may find himself in. You know if if one allows pride to prevail like Shevna does, right? We note that the mighty man, right, the, the gever, circle that word, or the gaver, okay, is the mighty man is unable to stand, right? He's hurled, he's literally ejected from his position, right, from the sense of being kicked, you know, con considering what Isaiah's written in, in verse 18, we see the, um, we, we see the repetition of, of three words and I'd have to go back to um, to the Hebrew text because I didn't have I only had verse 17 here but um, we see these these three words here sanof yitznafcha uh, senefa okay and these three words the King James translates he will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball okay and Isaiah uh, he goes on, he's saying, he goes on to say in these verses, um, he says, the um, shama mar mar kevot kevodecha kelon bayit adonecha. Okay, and that the chariots of thy glory will be the shame of your father's house, of, of your Lord's house. Okay, these chariots, these things here, um, the the chariots are are they're lightweight. They're a lightweight two-wheeled horse-drawn cart that's used for transportation and in war, such as being a mobile archery firing platform, right? And commonly used in ancient Near Eastern warfare from around the 18th century BC to the first century AD. The chariot was an important military vehicle in the ancient world, and the Tanakh refers to chariots over 160 times. Chariots first appear in the story about Joseph in, in Genesis 41, verse 43. And remember, it says, and he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, bow the knee, and he made him ruler over all of the land of Egypt. And that was Joseph, right? And Pharaoh had uh, given him his second position. Right, you know, behind him, and we also read that it, that that's a very that's a very prestigious position of power. And in in, in verse uh, chapter forty six, verse twenty nine of Genesis, Joseph goes out in his own chariot to meet his father. And so chariots are also connected to Egypt in the Exodus narrative. Remember, in Shemot in Exodus chapter fourteen, where Pharaoh chased the Israelites with his chariots through the Red Sea, right, that was split. And then subsequently they became bogged down in mud. God was fighting for them and, and 
elsewhere chariots are described in many battles. You know, Judges chapter four and chapter five. You know, describe the chariot armies of Sisera being defeated by Barak, right? And in the book of Second Samuel, Daniel is just, or sorry, David. David is described as hamstringing chariot horses, with the exception of enough to pull a hundred chariots. And we read that in Second Samuel chapter eight. And many of the biblical references to chariots occur in the books of First and Second Kings. And the major point is that these things describe military strength and prestige and glory, right? And this is how Isaiah is putting a spin on this concept of the chariot as being the shame of the house of your Lord, okay? The shame of the house of your, of your Lord. And ultimately, this is due to pride. Right? The outcome is shame, regardless of how massive one's army might be, which is described as the chariots of your glory. Okay, the chariots of your glory. Now, next verse we're looking at is, is verse 19, and it says, it says, Vecha daf ticha mimat savecha umimamadcha and yechar secha, okay, and, and that means that I will drive thee from the station, and from thy state shall you be, uh, shall be, he will pull thee down, right? So here, it's believed that Shebna and his pride led to his losing his position over the house, right? And it just says Isaiah chapter 36 verse 3 and, and chapter 22 speak of, you know, they seem to indicate uh, a final what finally took place when we, we get to Isaiah 30, chapter 36. Now, John Oswald, he states that Shebna was demoted to secretary and Eliakim was elevated to his place. And we note how these things illustrate something very important in what we see going on today, right? And you think about this for a second, that with the evil officials who are in office in the United States here, Right. They continue to be reelected over and over and over again. They're always able to maintain their office. And even after their term is up, they're promoted to some other high position in government so that they, they never leave. You know, and, and this is exactly what we see going on here in the Isaiah text. You know, that Shebna, he becomes secretary, where the bureaucrat is able to retain some form of hold on government and the titles change, but the faces remain the same working in the background. You know, as as we proceed on to Isaiah twenty two verses twenty to twenty four, the prophet Isaiah focuses on Eliakim and Shebna's successor. We note how a comparison is made and how Shebna would grind his teeth in envy for the powers that he lost which he which were given to another. And Eliakim was both had both faithfulness in character and in these things which were absent in Shebna. And so Isaiah goes on in verse 20 and he says the following here and he says Vehaya Bayom Hahu Ve Karati Le Avdi Le Aliakim Ben Hilkiyahu. Okay, and so that that's and he shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, son of Hilki Hilkiah. Okay, and so Elkiah, El El Eliakim was the son of Hilkiah and was one of the officers sent by Hezekiah to meet Sennacherib's Assyrian envoy from Lachish. And we read this in Second Kings chapter 18 and in Isaiah chapter 36. And these these events surround the following um, the following scriptures. So I, I put a little page here together to show these scriptures that um, the events that surround Isaiah 2220. So that Sennacherib's campaign against Judah is um, found in 2 Kings 18 through 19 in chapter 20 and 2 Chronicles 32 and Isaiah 22 here in our, in our chapter we're in, chapter 36 and chapter 37. And then Sennacherib threatens Jerusalem. We read that in 2 Kings 18, verses 17 to 37. 2 Chronicles 32 and Isaiah 36. And then Isaiah reassures Hezekiah in 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah chapter 37. We note how 
Isaiah states that I call my servant. You know, he says um, he says here the karate laavdi. Okay, I call my servant. You know, th this is a powerful title that God gives to Eliakim. You remember that this a title occurs first. In, to Isaiah in Isaiah 20 verse 3 and then to all of Israel according to chapters 40 through 55 chapter 66 and chapter 65 and, and, it, and it includes the suffering servant chapter of Isaiah 53 so those who belong to God are his servants who are used by his hand to do what he wants you know, these are those who enjoy the grace and mercy of God in their lives and who have a peace that surpasses all understanding just as we read according to the apostolic writings. Okay, so the next set of verses we're looking at here are uh, chapter or verse 21 to 22. And he goes on and it says, uh, and so he in, in verse 20 he says that I will call my servant Eliakim, and then in 21 it says uh, the he the heel bashti kutantecha the avnetcha um achazkenu umam shaltecha aten beyado. Okay, and so I will clothe him with robe and strengthen him with my girdle, and I will commit the government into his hand. Right? I will I will give the government into his hand. And then goes on. It says, "Vehaya la'av leyoshev Yerushalayim ulveit Yehuda." Okay, and I and I shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of the Hita, the house of Judah. Okay, and then in verse uh, 22, it says, "Natati mafteach veit David all." Shichmo u patach the ein soger the sagar the ein poteach. Okay, so that's uh, then the key of the house of David. I will lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. And so the Greek text translates this portion of the Hebrew Bible almost word for word when you look at the Septuagint. The idea is that. Eliakim will be empowered with the strength, with both strength and authority, right? And, and this is what's indicated by that about concerning that God giving the keys, okay, and then that um, anything He opens will not be shut, and anything that He shuts will not be open, right? And so the idea is that I will, in the verse, it says, I will clothe him with my robe and strengthen him with my girdle. Okay, so this suggests that these officials wore specific clothes to indicate their rank and office. And so God says, again, he says that, the, um, that he will give the kingdom into his hand, that he will give into his hand military strength. And that's what, that's what we read right here. And... Uh, there is an interesting phrase that's according to Isaiah 22, verse 22, which states the kind of authority that's given to this man, and, and that's the keys to the house of David, right? And we note how this has a, a very messianic flavor, you know, that according to the interpretation of the apostolic writings. So what I did was I, I looked at uh, some various references to keys, and we find a reference here uh, to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And we can see here in Revelation 3, verse 7, it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things shall he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth that no man openeth. Okay. And so um, we note here that Yeshua is the one who is given these keys and has the power to open or shut and no man has authority to change what he does. Now Eliakim being a father to those who dwell in Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. That's that's what what we read here and in the, in these in the Hebrew text and this suggests that he will be the true governor 
to the people. And then this draws a parallel again to Isaiah 9 verse 5 where, where it says that for every, oh actually it's verse 6 in the, um, verse 6 in the, the English translation, it's uh, verse 5 in the Hebrew Bible. And this, this connects us back to the Messiah of Israel and to Revelation 3, 7. And the idea of the keys that that are given that uh, open and, and close and no man can open or change what's been done. Now, uh, what's, what's being expressed here is of the care and the nurturing of this person as a father does to his son. He's not operating in pride. And so what he does is not in vain. For the ben it is done for the benefit of the people. And in the rule of Eliakim, we find a type of Messiah who would provide hope for the people. You know, having the keys given suggests that he has a right to allow or permit or disallow one from seeing the king. I mean, do you see the parallel here to King Messiah, right? Who has the power to permit us to stand before our Father in heaven? You know, these, these are powerful analogies and illustrate the thrust of the message that Isaiah is putting forward here to, in regard to pride, repentance, and mercy, and the forgiveness of God. You see how all these things are, are being coupled here in the Isaiah text. You know, these things are very similar to what Yeshua said according to Matthew 16, verses 18 to 19. And what he says is, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever that you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Okay, so we know we know that uh, what Yeshua was doing here. When we think about this, I just wanted to comment. I didn't put this in the study, but we know what Yeshua was doing. He was speaking to Peter, to Petros, right, the, the little rock. And when he said, behold, you are Peter, you are the little rock. And then he pointed at himself. He says, on this rock, I will establish, I will build my church. And he's referring to himself. I mean, we can't really imagine that God would build his church on a man, right, as opposed to Yeshua, his son. Right? So we know what Yeshua was doing here. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, the the building of the Catholic Church and you know, all this stuff. But okay, so these things that Yeshua says, you know, that, that what Yeshua is showing to his disciples in, in regard uh, to the depth of his authority to do these things, you know, that he has been given authority to do these things as the Messiah of God, and then. Isaiah, he goes on in the text, and he says uh, in in verses he looks at, we, he looks at uh, verses tw uh, we're gonna, we're looking at verse twenty three to twenty four, and so verse twenty three it says it says um, ut kati yated bamakom neaman okay and that I will I will Fasten him like a peg or as a nail in a sure place, and um, of faithfulness, right? And and it says, "Vehaya lekisa kavod leveit aviv," and he shall be a glorious for, throne for his father's house. Okay, and then in verse um, twenty-four, it says, "Vetalu alav kol kavod veit aviv." Okay, and, and he shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house. And then, Hatsaim, the Hatspiot, Kol Kale, Hakatan, Mikale, Haadganot, the Ad Kol Kale, Hanavalim. Okay, and then the, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from vessels of cups even to vessels of. Of uh, flagons, okay, and so this is really interesting. You know, when we look at the Septuagint and the Targum Jonathan and the Peshitta translations in regard to verses 23, or sorry, 22 and 23, and we note 
that the Greek translation it it says um, it says kai ateso alton arka arkonta ain to, topo um, pisto okay and it, it means that I will make him a faithful leader and then he goes on let's see um, he goes on. Yeah, okay, so we're, we're looking right here. We're looking right here at this verse. Okay. And then um, he goes on saying, um, let me see if I'm in the right spot here. Yeah. Okay, so then um, he says, he says, Kai S Tai S Thranon um, Doxes Tau Aikau Tau. Patros Alto, okay, and in that um, he will become a throne of glory of his father's house. Okay, so the, the Septuagint translates this consistently with the Masoretic text, what it says right here. And the uh, it's interesting how he will become a throne of glory to his father's house. I, I thought that um that was really interesting here you will become a throne throne of glory unto his father's house now the targum if we look at um the targum jonathan here um the targum translates and i will place the key of the house of the sanctuary and the government of the house of david in his hand and he shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open. And I will appoint him a faithful chief governor, an officer in a firm place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. All the nobles of his father's house shall rest themselves upon him. Children and children's children, from young men to little ones, from the priests clothed with the ephod to the Levites that are holding the lyres. Okay. So uh, these things remind us of the kingdom of God, right? And which establishes the conditions of God's rule over all of mankind. We're told in the New Testament that all authority and power has now been placed in Yeshua's hand, who establishes God's rule in our lives according to the Torah. You know, as Paul wrote in Romans 3:31, that we establish Torah in the Messiah Yeshua. Note that in Isaiah, Isaiah's time, Eliakim would be the one through whom his people would be honored, and upon him, the people will be lifted up so that they can rest with confidence in his rule, right? Because he's a righteous man. And so today, we have Yeshua who was lifted up and glorified, where it is through him that we are established, and the family of God is then lifted up, and upon whom we have we can have confidence in and trust and the hope of God, right? And note how the Septuagint writes that every esteemed person in his father's house will trust him and they will depend on him right and this provides a future expectation for the coming messiah that the one who would save us from our sins you know and isaiah then he goes on in in his uh in the text in verse 25 and he says the following this last verse So it says, uh, it says, "Bayom hahu neum Adonai You know, in in that day, uh, says the Lord of Hosts, and then it says, um, uh, "Tam Tamush hayated uh, hatkua b'makom neaman v'nig nig dea." The Nafla, the Nikrat, Hamasa, Asher, Aleha, Ki, Adonai, be there. Okay, so that, um, and, and the whole verse in, in the day, you know, Beyom Hu, Nehum, Adonai, Tseba Od, in the, in the day, say of the Lord of Hosts, shall the nail that is fastened, that peg that is fastened in the sure place, be removed and be cut down and fall, and the burden, remember the, um, Masa, the burden 
that uh, was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord has spoken. Okay, so this verse does seem a bit out of place. You know, the commentators have difficulty with this verse. It seems as if Eliakim was so lifted up and empowered, how could he fall, right? And and be cut down, because what we're, what we're looking at here is we're seeing that um, that he will fall and that he'll be cut down, right? And the burden will be upon, this burden will be upon him, right? And because the Lord has spoken, right? This is the word of the Lord. And so uh, the, the idea is that how could he fall if he was so high lifted up? And, and this may suggest a comparison then to the messianic expectation that we see in the Hebrew Bible in, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 5, you know, where his kingdom will be established. This, this Messiah, is, the kingdom will be established forever, whereas the kingdom of man will be finite. That's what we see here in I, Eliakim's reign. You know, and, and this is, again, this is consistent with the narrative that Isaiah has given us thus far. It's also consistent with what we see in the apostolic writings of, concerning Yeshua, right? The nation that places their trust in man will fail. And this may be what Isaiah is pointing out, regardless of how blessed and elevated a person is by God. You know, we are to trust in God alone and not man, right? A nation's only hope is in the Lord and not in men and women who hold political office or positions of power, right? It's like Judah. If we refuse to trust in God and instead trust in human leaders or foreign nations, inevitably we will be disappointed and worse yet, utterly destroyed just as Israel, Judah, and Jerusalem faced in the days of Isaiah the prophet. You know, thank God that we have a wonderful hope, the wonderful hope that we have in Yeshua the Messiah, whose kingdom is established forever and ever, right? In him, we can truly trust and we can truly have our hope. Baruch Hashem, right? Praise the Lord.